Welcome to Sleepy Eyes. I am your host, Varga. I take you on a journey in the dark of the night with warm tales. Take a moment to relax your body and mind with the current calmness. Breathe deeply, feel the energy inside, and let go of any tiredness. Put aside the past and focus on the peacefulness of the present moment. Recognize any tension in your body. Allow it to fade away and unwind. Discover your inner peace and simply unwind in the tranquility of now. Before going to sleep, prepare to read a story comfortably in this peaceful setting. Let the magic of words captivate you as you get lost in a tale or story. With the warmth from this peace and relaxation, your sleep will become even more serene. Close your eyes, embark on a journey with a touch of words. Let each word guide you a bit deeper toward the essence of your inner peace. Now, relax and enjoy the pleasure of getting lost in the enchanting world of the story before drifting into sleep. Sherlock Holmes Short Stories Writer Sir Arthur Conan Doyle The Patient Part 2 Yes, he has, said Holmes. Who are these two strangers, Mr. Blessington, and why are they your enemies? I really don't know, the fat man answered, but please come up to my rooms. We went with him into his bedroom. It was large and comfortable. Pointing to a big black box at the end of the bed, Mr. Blessington said, I have never been a very rich man, Mr. Holmes, and I don't like banks. I don't trust them. All my money is in that box, so of course I am very worried about this whole affair. Holmes looked at Blessington in his strange way, and then shook his head. I cannot possibly advise you if you try to deceive me, he said. But I have told you everything, said Blessington. Holmes turned away. Good night, Dr. Trevelyan, he said. But aren't you going to give me any advice, cried Blessington. My advice to you, sir, Holmes replied, is to tell the truth. A minute later, we were on our way home. As we walked down Harley Street, Holmes said, I'm sorry we have wasted our time this evening, Watson. This Brook Street affair is rather interesting, though. I don't understand it at all, I admitted. Well, those two men intend to harm Blessington for some reason. The young man went up to Blessington's rooms on both days, I am sure. By chance, Blessington was out. But Dr. Trevelyan thought the old man really had catalepsy, I said. It is not difficult to pretend to have catalepsy. I have done it myself. Why did the men choose such an unusual time of day? Because there must be nobody else in the waiting room. Watson, it is easy to see that Blessington is frightened for his life, and of course he knows who these two terrible enemies are. Perhaps tomorrow he will stop telling me lies. Holmes woke me up at half past seven the next morning. There is a carriage waiting for us, Watson, he said. What is the matter? I asked him. I have had a note from Dr. Trevelyan. In it, he says, come immediately, and nothing else. Twenty minutes later, we were back at the doctor's house. He came running out to meet us. His face was very pale. Oh, it's terrible, he cried. What has happened? We asked. Blessington has killed himself. Holmes whistled. Yes, Dr. Trevelyan continued. He hanged himself during the night. We went in with him. He took us into the waiting room. The police are already up there, he said. This death has been a terrible shock to me. When was he found? Holmes asked. One of the servants takes him a cup of tea at seven o'clock every morning. When she went into his bedroom this morning, she saw the poor man hanging in the middle of the room. He had tied a rope to the hook on which the lamp usually hangs, and he had jumped off the top of his strong box, the one he showed us yesterday. After thinking for a moment, Holmes said, I would like to go up now. We all went up to Blessington's bedroom. The body looked hardly human. A police officer was beside it, writing in his notebook. Ah, Mr. Holmes, he said. 
I am very glad to see you. Good morning, Lanner, Holmes said. Have you heard all about the events of the last few days? Yes. And what is your opinion of the affair? I think that fear had made Mr. Blessington crazy. He went to bed. His bed has been slept in, as you can see. Then, at about five o'clock, he got up and hanged himself. I felt the body. Yes, he does seem to have been dead for about three hours, I said. Have you found anything unusual in the room? Holmes asked the police officer. Well, sir, Mr. Blessington seems to have smoked a lot during the night. I found these four cigar ends in the fireplace. Holmes looked at them. And have you found Blessington's cigar holder? No, I haven't seen one. And where is his cigar case? Here it is. I found it in his coat pocket. Holmes opened it and smelt the one cigar which it contained. Oh, this is a Cuban cigar, he said. These others are Dutch. He examined them in detail. Two of these were smoked through a cigar holder. The other two were not. Two were cut by a knife that was not very sharp, and the other two were bitten by a person with excellent teeth. Mr. Blessington did not kill himself. He was murdered. That is impossible, cried Lanner. Why? Murderers never hang people, and in any case, how did they get in? Through the front door. It was barred this morning, because someone inside the house barred it. In a moment, I will tell you how this murder was done. He went over to the door and examined the lock on the bedroom door. Then he took out the key and examined that too. Next, he looked at the bed, the floor, the chairs, the dead body, and the rope. At last, he told us that he was satisfied, and we cut the rope and laid the body gently on the bed. We covered it with a sheet. Where did the rope come from? Holmes asked. It was cut off this longer one, said Dr. Trevelyan. He showed us a rope under the bed. He was terribly afraid of fire. He always kept this rope near him, so that he could climb down from the window if the stairs caught fire. Yes. All the facts are now very clear, Holmes said. I hope that I shall soon be able to tell you the reasons for them as well. I will borrow this photograph of Blessington, as it may help me in my inquiries. But you haven't told us anything, cried Dr. Trevelyan. Oh, there were two murderers, the men who pretended to be Russian lords, and they were helped by one of your own servants. My man has certainly disappeared, said the doctor. He let the murderers into the house, Holmes went on. Mr. Blessington's door was locked, but they turned the key with a strong piece of wire. You can see the marks quite clearly. They must have tied something over Mr. Blessington's mouth to prevent him from crying out. Then they held a trial in which they themselves were the judges. That was when they smoked cigars. When it was over, they took Blessington and hanged him. Then they left. The servant barred the front door after they had gone. Lanner hurried away to try to find the servant. Holmes and I returned to Baker Street for breakfast. I shall be back by three o'clock, Holmes said when we had finished our meal. Lanner and Dr. Trevelyan will meet me here then. The police officer and the doctor arrived at three, but Holmes did not join us until a quarter to four, but I could see that he was cheerful. Have you any news, Lanner? He asked. We have caught the servant, sir, Lanner replied. Excellent. And I have discovered who the murderers are. Their names are Biddle and Hayward. The Worthingdon bank robbers, cried Lanner. Yes, and the man who used the name Blessington was another of them. So his real name must have been Sutton. Everything is clear now, said Lanner. But Trevelyan and I still did not understand. Have you forgotten the great Worthingdon bank robbery? said Holmes. There were four robbers, Biddle, Hayward, Sutton, and a man called Cartwright. A night watchman was killed, and the thieves got away with seven thousand pounds. That was fifteen years ago. When the case came to court, there was not much proof against the robbers. But this man, Blessington, that is, Sutton, 
decided to help the police. The result was that Cartwright was hanged, and Biddle and Hayward were sent to prison for 15 years. When they were let out, they decided to punish Sutton, that is, Blessington, for what he had done. Nobody was punished for Blessington's death. Biddle and Hayward were drowned soon afterwards when a steamer called the Nora Crena sank off the coast of Portugal, and there was not enough proof against Dr. Trevelyan's servant, so he was never charged. No complete account of the Brook Street mystery has ever been given to the public until now.